Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons that's prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series is entitled Present Truth in Deuteronomy. And this is lesson number 10 in that series for December 4 of 2021 entitled Remember, Do Not Forget. Hmm, that kind of sounds like the same thing, doesn't it? Well, let's see what the lesson tells us about this issue. We always like to begin with a word of prayer. Father, we ask for your guidance today. We have seen so many things here in the book of Deuteronomy that we need to learn from. Imagine Moses under the circumstances in which he lived, writing these things down with a language so limited, and yet here we have it, translated for us, in our, in our language we can understand 3,500 years later. Help us to see and remember and not forget as you encourage us to do is our prayer in Jesus' name, amen. The book of Deuteronomy is all about remembering. There are two words that appear many times in the Bible. One is remember and the other is forget. They are opposites. God is constantly asking us to remember and not to forget. Imagine Moses speaking to the children of Israel. He knew he, knew he was not going to be in entering the land of Canaan. At age 120 years of age, he was about to die. I mean, you know, how would you feel if God had told you, okay, you're gonna die? Kind of pretty permanent, isn't it? He thought back over the prior 40 years that he had led the children of Israel and remembered many things that he wanted the children of Israel never to forget. And how old was Moses when he started his, work, his serious work? 80. 80. That, that's encouraging for some yeah. of us. <laughs> the prophets, what, what work are you about to begin? <laughs> The prophets right through the Old Testament repeatedly encouraged the children of Israel to remember how God had led them in the past. But they were not only to remember how God had led them in the past, but also to remember the, con the covenant that God had given them from the time they left Egypt. And how had they responded to that covenant as we studied in our last lesson? All that the Lord had said we will do and but Moses didn't and Moses wrote it down he said do you remember what God said oh wh what'd you say to God yeah all that the Lord has said well let me write that down and read it to you so he writes it down reads it to the good all that the Lord has said we will do yeah and a couple of days later they were dancing drunk and naked around yeah. the golden calf hmm. shouldn't we remember all that God has done for us in our day Think of all the revelation of truth that God has provided through the scriptures and the spirit of prophecy. Why is it so easy for us to get wrapped up in our daily activities and forget to express to God our commitment to him and forget to remember all he has done for us? This is, there's, a, there's a term for this that I like and I, I come back to it every once in a while. The tyranny of the urgent. We don't have time for the important because we gotta do what has to be done right now. The tyranny of the urgent. In this lesson, we will speak briefly about several major events in biblical history. The first time the word remember was used in the Bible was immediately after the worldwide flood. God had placed a rainbow in the sky to, rem in the sky to remind people of his promise to them. Jim? <coughs> Excuse me. Genesis 9, verses 18, 8 to, excuse me, verses 8 to 17. God said to Noah and his sons, I am now making my covenant with you and with your descendants and with all living things, all birds and all animals, everything that came out of the boat with you. With these words, I make my covenant with you. I promise never again will all living beings be destroyed by a flood. Never again will a flood destroy the earth. As a sign of this everlasting covenant, which I am making with you and with all living things, I am putting my bow in the clouds. It will be a sign 
of my covenant with the world. Whenever I cover the sky with clouds and the rainbow appears, I will remember. Hold on just a minute. Who's having trouble remembering? God said, well, it says, I will remember. <laughs> so why? It doesn't it, say that God's having trouble remembering. It's just, I will remember then. Yes. Okay, remember, I will remember. My promises to you and all the animals that that a flood will never again destroy all living beings. When the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between me and all living things, all living beings on the earth. That is the sign of the promise which I am making all living thing, living beings. American Bible Society, 1992. Good news translation. Okay. We recognize that God does not need to be reminded of anything. He was speaking to us in terms that we can understand. Do you remember the long word that we used to describe that? Anybody? Anthropomorphism. God acting as if he were all, had the limitations that we have. His words are to form a kind of promise to us that the rainbow will always be a memorial of what happened at the flood, and God's promise never again to destroy this earth with water. So why is it that so many scientists today ignore the idea that God placed a rainbow in the sky? In fact, they do not believe that God sent a worldwide flood at all. It is interesting to note that Ellen White stated this important point about the people who lived just before the flood. They argued that, quote, nature's laws are so firmly established that God himself could not change them. Patriarchs and Prophets 97, paragraph 1. Today, scientists claim that the laws of nature tell them that the flood never happened at all. Sounds kind of familiar, doesn't it? So whom should we trust? The God who placed a rainbow in the sky to remind us? Or speculative scientists who doubt that the flood ever happened? Have they not flown in an airplane? I, I just flew to Denver and and looking out you I mean you cannot deny that something flowed through yeah yeah I I my father had a small private plane when I was young and if you if you, you happen to get just in the right situation you can see of course you can't see the wing above you you can't look through the wing the, the wing above you but you can see a 360 degree circle if, if you get just the right angle and so forth like that. Uh, but there's a memorial that God talked about that occurred even before the flood. God gave us the seventh day Sabbath to remind us of creation and all that it means to us. It's a whole paradigm that goes with Sabbath observance. What God wanted us to learn and to remember from creation is so important that he's given us a reminder that comes at the end of every week. Are we making proper use of the Sabbath hours to remember all that God has done for us? Many, many times in the Old Testament, the children of Israel were told to remember what God did for them and bringing them out of Egypt. There, are, uh, there must be hundreds of verses. Mirac Literally, there, if you go through the Old Testament there, and mark it, there's literally all, every call, almost every column, there's yeah. at least one. Yep. Reference to Egypt. He brought, he brought them out of Egypt, miraculously taking them through the Red Sea, escaping from their enemies, and then speaking to them from Mount Sinai. Do you think anyone who is present there at the foot of Mount Sinai and saw the events on that incredible day could ever forget what they saw and heard? You know, one of the, one of the sad things that, that I think about is the people who really the adult population that really saw that and should have been teaching that to their children and their grandchildren and their great-grandchildren, they all died in the next 40 years. God through Moses had some very clear words about what they were supposed to remember. That's yours, I believe. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 32 to 39. Search the past, the time before you were born, all the way back to the time when God created humanity on the earth. Search the entire earth 
Has anything as great as this ever happened before? Has anyone ever heard of anything like this? Have any people ever lived after hearing a God speak to them from a fire as you have? Has any God ever dared to go and take people from another nation and make them his own, as the Lord your God did for you in Egypt? And there's, I mean, you can, go, you can look back through ancient history and so I look at any history you want, but there's nothing else in history like this. Just absolutely a unique experience. Before your very eyes, he used his great power and strength. He brought plagues and war, worked miracles and wonders, and caused terrifying things to happen. The Lord has shown you this to prove to you that he alone is God and that there is no other. He let you hear his voice from heaven so that he could instruct you. And here on earth he let you see his holy fire and he spoke to you from it. So let's, let's interrupt for just a second. Apparently they saw a literal fire there at the top of the mountain. That's what seems to be implied. Yeah. Because he loved your ancestors, he chose you. And by his great power, he himself brought you out of Egypt. As you advanced, he drove out nations greater and more powerful than you, so that he might bring you in and give you their land, the land which still belongs to you. So remember today and never forget, the Lord is God in heaven and on earth. There is no other God. And that's from the Good News Bible. Remember and never forget. Moses, who wrote the first books of Scripture, was pointing the people of Israel back to the earlier events in history and telling them what they should have learned and how it should have impacted them on a day-by-day -day basis. He reminded them that no other group of people or nation had ever gone through an experience like what they had just been through. And, you know, we know from the story of Rahab that news about this got out. I mean, I don't know how far it spread. Did How many different people, obviously the Egyptians knew about what had happened, and the people in Palestine found out what, what had happened. How far did it go? I don't know. And then Moses got to the punchline. Deuteronomy 4, verse 40. Obey all his laws that I have given you today, and all will go well with you and your descendants. You will continue to live in the land which the Lord your God is giving you to be yours forever. Good News Bible. God has a definite plan in rescuing his people from Egypt. Had a definite plan. They were to be a light to the world for the rest of human history. And remember, where is Palestine located? <clears throat> crossroads. At the crossroads of three continents. I mean, it's the, I don't, there's no place else in the world that you could, you could have three continents come together. God was asking them to obey not just to show that he was boss, but also because it was the right thing to do. It would always be for their best good, even though it might not seem like it at the time it happened. And what has God said to us in the New Testament? Revelation fourteen twelve. This calls for endurance on the part of God's people, those who obey God's commandments and are faithful to Jesus. In the Good News Bible. So clear at the end of... The New Testament, we have God saying, do what? Obey. Obey God's commandments. Notice these very clear words from Moses in Deuteronomy 4, 9 and 23 to 24. Be on your guard. Make certain that you do not forget. As long as you live what you have seen with your own eyes, tell your children and your grandchildren. Be careful that you do not forget the covenant that the Lord your God made with you. Obey his command not to make yourselves any kind of idol, because the Lord your God is like a flaming fire. He tolerates no rivals. Now, why does God talk like that? Sounds like almost like a bully, doesn't he? He's talking to people who have been slaves for generations. Yep. All they knew was, do this or I'll whip you do this or I'll kill you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And now they're talking about not human masters, but a flaming fire. Ooh. 
Do you think that if you had been through an experience like the Exodus, you would remember it and it would impact you in the way you live every day? Would you ever be inclined to forget? I like to think about an experience like that. What happened the next day after the Sinai thing when the people all came back together and they went back to their tents and they came out maybe the next morning after sleeping and said, did you see that? I mean, can, can, I mean what do they say to each other? I, I'm, there's so many things I'm looking forward to seeing when we get to, I'm sure we're going to see that. That's going to be one of the things we're going to see in the panorama. Well, the word translated be on your guard or take heed in Deuteronomy 4 9 are repeated many times in Scripture to mean keep, watch, preserve, or guard. In fact, way back in Genesis 2.15, we note that God told Adam to keep the garden he had given to him. Now, part of the reason why one word means so many different things is because the vocabulary was very limited in those days. And so we, we, we need to, well, fear is another example. The word fear from the Old Testament can mean everything from abject terror to respect and honor. When Moses came down from the mountain and found a number of the children of Israel dancing drunk and naked around the golden calf, which they called Yahweh, the personal name of God, do you think those people had forgotten what God had done for them? There's no way they could have forgotten. So what was happening? They literally claimed that the golden calf was what had brought them out of Egypt. Now, I, I, I think they... I don't think they thought the calf literally did it. I think they, they must have thought that this calf just represented. You think back what, to the, what that is describing. Remember this phrase, people go mad rapidly in crowds, but return to their senses slowly, one by one. Yeah. I mean, you don't, but when people carry it on like that, there's no serious thinking going yeah. on. Well, Aaron helped them. Sure. Uh, yeah. Aaron knew better. Yeah. Well, they all should have known better, but... They were actively rebels. Mm -hmm. Not just yeah. ignorance, they were active rebels. They claimed that the golden calf was what had brought them out of Egypt. So the problem was not just that they had forgotten, how could they? The problem was that they wanted to celebrate that event in their own way and not in God's way. One way in which we can remember and not forget even the details of important stories is to try to teach those details to someone else, especially to our own children. Notice this advice given by Moses. I mean, if you want to nail something, uh, let, me, let me just tell you, all the lessons that I've taught and so forth and tried to lead out, you go over these things and over these things. The best way to, to learn something is to try to explain it to somebody else. Deuteronomy 6, that's mine. Teach them to your children. Repent them when, I'm sorry, repeat them when you are at home and when you are away, when you are resting and when you are working. Deuteronomy 11, 19, teach them to your children. Talk about them when you are at home and when you are away, when you're resting and when you are working. And those aren't the only verses. There are other verses that say basically the same thing. If the children of Israel had made it a habit to remind their children in detail of what happened to them, they themselves, as well as their children, would not have forgotten. Jim? Not only did their children need to hear things, excuse me, hear about these things, but also perhaps even more important, by telling and retelling the stories of what God had done for them, the people would not forget what those things were. Hence, what better way to preserve knowledge of what the Lord had done for his chosen people, Adult Bible Study Guide. Tuesday. So, what's the way, and for Tuesday, November 30, I'm sorry, what's the method that God said? Teach it to your children. Teach it to your grandchildren. Repeat it, repeat it, repeat it. How do we memorize things? They didn't have TVs and nope. cell phones well, why and everything. Is it, why is it so difficult 
that you have to keep repeating it to understand it. To... Well, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm not the only one that's learned that. Uh, you know, I, I yeah. agree with you 100%. Yeah. It's just why when it's something that should be easy. Yeah. So difficult. It's so easy to get distracted with the tyranny of the urgent again. What's right in front of you, what you got to do right now is what you're thinking about. And it gets worse with age. Yes. So why is it that we are so prone to forget even incredible experiences like the Exodus? It is likely that almost every one of us has stopped and thought back to some incredible event in our own lives which we have just about forgotten. Amazing. Is it possible that God has done one or more things for us that we believe were actually miracles? Do we recount those stories to our children? I have some miracles in my, in my, in my life. Yeah, I've told the, my stories to my grandchildren. Good. Moses, and I have too, Moses did not stop with the story about Mount Sinai. Forty more years had followed as they were wandering through the uh, desert. They had many experiences that happened to them that needed to be remembered. Gary? Uh, reading from chapter 8 in Deuteronomy and verses 7 through 18. The Lord your God is bringing you to into a fertile land, a land that has rivers and springs and underground streams gushing out into the valleys and hills. A land that produces wheat and barley, grapes, figs, pomegranates, olives, and honey. There you will never go hungry or ever be in need. Let me interrupt for a second. Yeah, the, Jin, the Jordan River now is being pumped out and used for irrigation in so many places that there's hardly anything more than a trickle at the bottom. In fact, Israel has now become one of the, probably the foremost nation in in converting seawater to yeah. pure water for people to use. Desalination. No? Yes. Yeah. Go ahead. There you will never go hungry or ever be in need. Its rocks have iron in them, and from its hills you can mine copper. You will have all you want to eat, and you will give thanks to the Lord your God for the fertile land that he has given you. Make certain that you do not forget the Lord your God. Do not fail to obey any of his laws that I am giving you today. When you have all you want to eat and have built good houses to live in, and when your cattle and sheep, your silver and gold, and all your other possessions have increased, make sure that you do not become proud and forget the Lord your God who rescued you from Egypt where you were slaves. Mm. He led you through that vast and terrifying desert where there were poisonous snakes and scorpions. I want to interrupt there for a second. If you go back to Numbers, the way it's worded, it sounds like God sent the poisonous snakes and scorpions. But it says here, they were there. The, only, the reason it seemed like God had sent them is because he had been protecting them all along. And now when they were rejecting him, he stopped protecting them. And guess what? There are the snakes and the scorpions, right? So this is a very important uh, verse to remember when you're talking about, uh, you know, that he, they put up that cross with the snake on it, yeah. so forth like that, back in, in Numbers. In that dry and waterless land, he made water flow out of solid rock for you. In the desert, he gave you manna to eat, food that your ancestors had never eaten. He sent hardships on you to test you so that in the end he could bless you with good things. So then you must never think that you have made yourselves wealthy by your own power and strength. Remember that it is the Lord your God who gives you the power to become rich. He does this because he is still faithful today to the covenant that he made with your ancestors. And that's from the Good News Bible. Wow. What do you think the children of Israel thought about the land of Canaan after hearing these words from Moses? None of them had ever been there, as far as we know. But God knew that giving them this very wonderful land with all its benefits would bring a dangerous possibility. 
Why is it that wealth and physical prosperity tends to make us forget God? Who is it that gives us the power to work and earn money and get wealth? Jesus reminded us of those hazards when he gave us the story of the sower and the seed. Mark 4, 19. But the worries about this life, the love of riches and all other kinds of desires, crowd in and choke the message. They don't bear fruit. And they remember, don't bear fruit. Yeah, remember this is a story where the the, the people, the man is out there sowing a seed, and it talks about the different places it landed, different places, and how, where it landed, and how it was. So here's the here's the stuff, the seed that was sown among the weeds. The weeds grew up and choked it out, and so forth. No matter how much money, and how many material possessions we have here, we are all flesh and blood awaiting a hole in the ground. Isn't that exciting? Yeah. What, the, what should this tell us about the dangers that come from wealth in that wealth can make us forget our need for the only one who can deliver us from that hole in the ground? <laughs> yeah. The Bible study wow. guide for Wednesday. For Wednesday, December 1. Isn't it exciting to think about? I get to be in a hole in the ground. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to be asleep. There. I won't care. You won't care? No. Does it seem possible that one could forget that she or he had once been a slave? God recognized that even that would need to be remembered, and so he said... From multiple places in Deuteronomy, starting with Deuteronomy 5.15, Remember that you were slaves in Egypt, and that I, the Lord your God, rescued you by my great power and strength. That is why I command you to observe the Sabbath. I thought it was because of a memorial of creation. God, it both? God keeps ask, adding more and more reasons for more and more things to think about and remember on the Sabbath. From Deuteronomy 6.12, make certain that you do not forget the Lord who rescued you from Egypt, where you were slaves. Deuteronomy 15.15, 15, remember that you were slaves in Egypt and the Lord your God set you free. That is why I am now giving you this command. Deuteronomy 16, verses 3 and 12. When you eat this meal, do not eat bread prepared with yeast. For seven days you are to eat bread prepared without yeast, as you did when you had to leave Egypt in such a hurry. Now let me interrupt for a second. What were they making their bread out of? Manna, wasn't it? Deuteronomy? What? Manna? Yeah. And they had to pound it, apparently. and it's called manhu or something. Like, what is it? I think it's yeah. what, the, the, mana. Mana, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so forth. Uh, and I don't know. But on Friday, it, it would last till the next day. But mm. if you had any other day and keep yeah. it a little extra, <laughs> it goes Boy, foul. Oh. Yeah, but it, it, you know, it must have been a pretty nice stuff. I mean, it tastes like, what did they say, some kind of seeds mixed with honey or something like that? Sesame seeds mixed with honey? Wasn't that what something. It was? yeah. Again, when you eat this meal, do not eat bread prepared with yeast. For seven days you are to eat bread prepared without yeast, as you did when you, were, when you had to leave Egypt in such a hurry. Eat this bread. It will be called the bread of suffering, so that, you, as, so that as long as you live, you will remember the day you came out of Egypt, that place of suffering. Be sure that you obey these commands. Do not forget that you were slaves in Egypt. I mean, it's amazing. God had to say, keep saying, do not forget that you were slaves in Egypt. And what did they huh? do? They forgot. And Deuteronomy 24, 18 and, and 22. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt and that the Lord your God set you free. That is why I have given you this command. I, I feel like the, these slaves in Egypt were slaves to hierarchy, the different levels of people in Egypt. So when they came out and they developed a little bit of wealth, they were going to be 
powerful over someone else. They have yeah. pecking orders and, and uh, vertical. Yeah, let's forget about the fact that we were slaves and we once went yeah. through that. Yeah. But. And then you come to John fifteen fifteen. He says, I "Don't call you slaves. I call you friends." That's mm -hmm. horizontal. That's yeah. not a hierarchy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Deuteronomy twenty four twenty two. Never forget that you were slaves in Egypt. That is why I have given you this command. All from the Good News Bible. Even to this day, Jews who are faithful to the Scriptures celebrate the Passover. And if you hear a faithful conservative Jew talk about the Seder, I believe they call it, and the meal that that's connected with Passover. It's a it's a very impressive whole process. It is a memorial that even we as Christians have taken over and remember. Notice what Moses told them about the Passover. Exodus twelve verses twenty five to twenty seven. When you enter the land that the Lord has promised to give you, you must perform this ritual. When your children ask you. What does this ritual mean? You will answer, it is the sacrifice of Passover to honor the Lord. Because he passed over the houses of the Israelites in Egypt. He killed the Egyptians but spared us. The Israelites knelt down and worshipped. Wow. Following the advice of Paul, we celebrate the Passover in a, in a bit of a different way. 1 Corinthians 5, 7. You must remove the old yeast of sin so that you will be entirely pure. Then you will be like a new batch of dough without any yeast. As ne indeed I know you actually are, for your Passover, excuse me, for our Passover festival is ready now that Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. And we celebrate not just, I mean, remember, they were supposed to eat roasted lamb with bitter herbs and uh, then presumably this bread that's made without yeast or something very quickly prepared and so forth like this. And we celebrate doing what? Grape juice and a small wafer. Yeah. Yeah. Because we're celebrating the death of Christ, right? Paul reminded those early Christians that they had come out of paganism. That was just as remarkable as coming out of Egyptian slavery. Gary? <laughs> I really wandered off, I'm sorry. Uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 13. For it is by God's grace that you have been saved through faith. It is not the result of your own efforts, but God's gift, so that no one can boast about it. God. Now, why does it say that? Have you ever stopped to ask yourself, why does it say that? And, and the simple way I would put it, at least in my mind, is that if we had, if God hadn't given us the Bible, if He hadn't given up, we Adventists hadn't given us the spirit of prophecy, what would we know? Yeah. We, we we wouldn't have any idea if we if we would have no record of the death of the life and death of Christ. I mean. It's God gave us those things. This was said there in Romans 3 that we read earlier. What, what, what did it say there? The, 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 the truth of God, the messages was given first to the Jews. And this is what we're, we're studying here. So uh, at least that much is a gift. Yeah. Go ahead. God has made us what we are, and in our union with Christ Jesus, he has created us for a life of good deeds which he has already prepared for us to do. You Gentiles by birth, called the uncircumcised by the Jews, who call themselves the circumcised, and in brackets it says, which refers to what men do to their bodies. Remember what you were in the past. At that time you were apart from Christ. You were foreigners and did not belong to God's chosen people. You had no part in the covenants which were based on God's promises to his people. And you lived in this world without hope and without God. Let me interrupt for a second. <clears throat> Think of where Paul came from. I am sure that back in his early days he thought, I am a Jew, I am a Hebrew, I belong to the tribe of Benjamin. You know, he talks about this uh, descendant of, of Jews and so forth and a member of the Sanhedrin and boy, and to be circumcised, 
You're a nobody if you're not circumcised, right? That would have been his attitude. Look what he's saying now. Yeah. But now in union with Christ Jesus, you who used to be far away have been brought near by the blood. And there's a footnote there, by the blood of Christ or by the sacrificial death of Christ. Okay, and good. it finishes of Christ in the Good News Bible. Do we stop and remind ourselves on a regular basis that God has done so many things for us which we could never have accomplished for ourselves no matter how successful we think we are? We think you could figure out some way to go to heaven on your own? Lots of people try. Tried, yes. The devil tried. Yep. What is it that God would like us to remember so close to the final history of this world? Oh, sorry, I'm thinking about, <laughs> I made a couple trips to the airport recently and just driving on the freeway, mm -hmm. I'm thankful to get home safely <laughs> with the crazy people on the, the road. Yeah. Okay. Um, it it moved, would be well. It, it moved. Here we go. It would be well for us to spend a thoughtful hour each day in contemplation of the life of Christ. Now, let me stop and let me interrupt right there. Why would she say that? If salvation, if our salvation depends on our being transformed by beholding we become changed, right? Yes. What would happen if we spent a thoughtful hour every day thinking about the life and death of Christ? We might be changed. What an incredible opportunity, huh? Okay, go ahead. We should take it point by point and let the imagination grasp each scene, especially the closing ones. As we thus dwell upon his great sacrifice for us, our confidence in him will be more constant, our love will be quickened, and we shall be more deeply imbued with his spirit. Ellen G. White, Desire of Ages, page 83. Wow. Yeah. So are we remembering the great events in salvation history? Events from the creation, to the story of Noah being saved from the flood, to the story of the children of Israel being brought out of slavery in Egypt, down through the life and death of Jesus Christ? From Patriarchs and Prophets, page 106 and 7. How great the condescension of God and his compassion for his erring creatures in thus placing the beautiful rainbow in the clouds as a token of his covenant with men. The Lord declares that when he looks upon the bow, he will remember his covenant. Now, I, I don't, let me stop for just a second. You've all studied science more or less at some point or another. What happens with the what, how, how do we believe that the rainbow is produced? Refraction of light through the raindrops. They act as a prism. Okay. So when you, you've all seen pictures of the a raindrop, and was it shaped like? Like this. And so you have basically a prism at the top, a tail bar to the part of the rain. And why does that spread the light out? Do you remember? the different distances that the light goes through. The speed at which it travels. Yeah, the, and the different distances yeah. Yeah, make it spread out. Yeah. yeah. It, it, uh, I, I don't know. I, I always thought of it as purely with water, but it's not. You can get that from fine dust with a wind behind it. Yeah. Which I never realized That's until I saw some a while back. Well, anyway... So, and God knew that it was good. And why was it that there were no rainbows before the flood? There was no rain before the flood. There was no rain before the flood, okay? So the Lord declares that when he looks upon the bow, he will remember his covenant. This does not imply that he would ever forget, but he speaks to us in our own language that we may better understand him. I'm going to interrupt again for that. What's that fancy long word that describes that? Anthropomorphism. Anthropomorphism, two Greek words put together. Go ahead. It was God's purpose that as the children 
of the of after generations should ask the meaning of the glorious arch that spans the heavens, their parents should repeat the story of the flood and tell them that the Most High had bended the bow and placed it in the clouds as an assurance that the water should never again overflow the earth. Thus, from generation to generation, it would testify of divine love to man and would strengthen his confidence in God. Ellen White, Patriarchs and Prophets. Okay, I won't ask you to answer this right now, but I'll throw it out to you there in the audience to think about why is the rainbow like this? We've talked about why the different colors are there, but why does it go like this? You think about that for a while. Surely you recognize that at least for those of us who live in the Western world, our times are more prosperous than probably any time in the past. But this easy living has come at a cost. It tends to make us forget. And why do we forget? If you think you earn everything, that everything that you have, and it's all just coming easy and so forth like that, um, you don't need God. In fact, the Western world is trying to, has tried very hard to get rid of God. The whole idea of revolution was, in a, I mean, if you have no other explanation from the origin of, of the human race or for origin of anything except God, then you're in, in trouble. But if you can come up with the idea of evolution, you can hopefully you can you can get rid of God. Yeah. Well, how could we do that when we consider all that God has done for us? As you look around in the world, do you find that those who are wealthy are more spiritual or less so? How often do you stop and think for a few minutes about what the life and death of Jesus Christ means for you? Are you fully convinced about, and able to explain satisfactorily why you believe that God created our world and that it was destroyed by a worldwide flood in the days of Noah? If someone who was an evolutionist came and said, why do you choose to believe this? You would say, uh, 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 what would you say? Look at the Grand Canyon. Yes. Look at the Grand Canyon? Look, That's at a, the, look at the inverted layers of the, quote, geological column yep. in various places. Look at the places where it's missing. Yep. And look at the Bible. Mm -hmm. Okay, there's lots of, lots of, there's just a few examples. Yeah. Um, it has often been suggested that those who do not learn from history are doomed to repeat it. I'm not sure if you could do that with the flood, but we can go around and around on the subject. Are we remembering creation, the flood, the exodus, and the world from which we have escaped into Christianity every Sabbath as we celebrate what God has done for us? Because all those things are, I mean, that's part of our history and that's part of the stuff we're supposed to be remembering, right? Moses was very aged when he wrote the book of Deuteronomy. Is that why he kept repeating? Is that perhaps why he repeatedly suggested that they needed to remember? Of course, in the book of Deuteronomy, it is God that we need to remember and all that he has done for us. Repeatedly, Moses reminded them of God rescuing them from, the slave, from slavery in Egypt. And there are all those verses. Uh, just look at a couple of them since we have a moment. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt and that I, the Lord your God, rescued you by my great power and strength. That is why I command you to observe the Sabbath. And we, we read a whole bunch of these things just a little while ago. Notice these very interesting ideas about the first thing in human history, creation. The verb remember refers in fact to the creator, our maker, without whom we would not be here. Creation is the first event to be remembered because it is the event that reports our roots. It's one of the great existential questions. What are the existential questions? Do you remember? Where do we come from? Why are we here? Where are we going? Where do we come from? Why are we here? And along with that, how, how we can do the best, accomplish the best good in life, and where are we going after we die? Significantly, the fourth commandment, which enjoins us to remember, 
parallels the fifth commandment, Exodus 20, verse 12, which enjoins us to honor our parents. This parallel is not only visible in the structure of the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments, it also appears in the grammatical structure of the verbs. Both verbs, remember and honor, are used in the positive imperative. All the other commandments are written in the negative form. What, what's, what's different about that? Do this as opposed to don't do that. Yeah. Well, the the uh, Young's literal translation says that the Hebrew is written such that thou it's prospective, it's looking forward to a time when you won't be doing those things. Mm -hmm. rather but it's than, still negative. Yes. You will yeah, not. I agree. Yeah, but but it's it's uh, you've got you've attained a level of maturity yeah. enough that you won't be doing that. One uh, one way that the the negative commandments can be stated is you will not. Mm -hmm. You will not. You will not. So remember that the Sabbath or where we come from is related to remembering our parents who are our roots. If we fail to remember our past, our roots, we will fail to, uh, to blossom spiritually. Both commandments, the fourth and the fifth, contain the promise of the future, just as the Sabbath promise promises the future day of rest for the humankind. Look at a couple of verses, Psalm 95, 11. I was angry and made a solemn promise you will never enter the land where I would have given you rest. Compare Hebrews 3, 11, I'm sorry. Pop back here again. Hebrews 3, 11. I was angry and made you a solemn promise they will never enter the land where I would have given them rest. So, why was God angry? It's not too complicated a question, is it? Because they were not doing what they were supposed to be doing. And when you turn away from God, what happens? If you repeatedly turn away from God, let you go. Let you go. And our verses that it refers to in Hebrews, three, uh, Hebrews chapter four is verse three. We who believe then do receive that rest which God had promised. It's just as He said, I was angry and made a solemn promise they will never enter the land where I would have given where I would have given them rest. He said this even though His work had been finished from the time He created the world. For somewhere in the Scripture. This is said about the seventh day, God rested on the seventh day from all his work. And why didn't, why didn't Paul give us the, 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 the chapter and the verse? Because chapters and verses had not been invented, invented yet. Yeah. Exactly. The Bible was a continuous scroll. Mm -hmm. Each book was a continuous scroll. Yeah. Jesus himself warned us that the days just before the flood will be like those days just before his second coming. And what were the, what were the days like before the second coming? If, before the flood, you mean? I'm sorry, before the flood, yes. They were eating and drinking and yeah. let me, giving let me in marriage. Let me make this a little bit larger so we can read it easier. Well, it's not going to do that for me right now. No one knows, however. No one knows, however, when that day and hour will come. Neither the angels in heaven nor the Son of God, nor the Son, the Father alone knows. The coming of the Son of Man will be like what happened in the time of Noah. In the days before the flood, people ate and drank, men and women married, up to the very day Noah went into the boat that they did not realize what was happening until the flood came and swept them all away. That is how it will be when the Son of Man comes. Hmm. What does that tell us about being ready? Yeah. It is very interesting to notice that just as the Sabbath was placed as a celebration at the end of seven days of creation, the story of the flood is reported in Genesis 7 and 8, talks repeatedly about week-long periods of seven days. Notice the chiastic structure. You know what a chiastic structure is? Symmetry, basically. Mm -hmm. With the most important point being in the center. Okay, let's look at this chiastic structure. Seven days of God's waiting, 
Genesis 4, or 7 verse 4, seven days from now I am going to send rain that will fall for 40 days and nights in order to destroy all the living beings that I have made. So that was the fourth. Then seven days of waiting again, Genesis 7, 10, seven days later the flood came. And then we come to, come on, Uh, 40 days of water increasing, Genesis 7, 17. The flood continued for 40 days and the water became, became deep enough for the boat to float. Um, we see, we see uh, floods going on in the East Coast these days. It seems like every time you turn around there's another one. Imagine a flood high enough so that it covers the whole world. And 40 days of nonstop uh, I lived in Africa, and and uh, when it rained, I mean, it just like someone turned off, open, a, tipped a bucket over, you know, whoop. I mean, imagine 40 days of that. Then 150 days of water prevailing. Look at verse 7, verse 24. The water did not start going down for 150 days. Did not start going down for 150 days. And then God remembered, Genesis 8, 1, God had not forgotten Noah and all the animals with him in the boat. He caused a wind to blow and the water started going down. And then 150 days of water decreasing, Genesis 8, 3, and the water gradually went down for 150 days. So how long, how, how many days do we have added up now? 150 and 150. 300, 354 so, this, so far actually. This is actually more than, yeah, it's basically a year, more than a year. 150 days of the water decreasing, 40 days of water decreasing, Genesis 8, 6, and then seven days of Noah's waiting for the bird to come back with their leaf and so forth, and then seven days of Noah's waiting. So you can see the structure here, 7, 7, 40, 150, God remembers, 150, 40, 7, 7. Why do you suppose it's done like that? It was the Hebrew form of poetry, one of the Hebrew forms of poetry, wasn't it? Yes, okay. And what, why? It's easy, easier to remember. Easier to remember. We've already mentioned the fact that the story of the Exodus is the most mentioned thing to be remembered by the children of Israel in the Old Testament. Often it is repeated that they needed to remember, quote unquote, as the first imperative, and then in a second imperative told, do not forget. We've already seen several verses like that. God knew that those people would be very stubborn. The Ark of the Covenant was carried by the children of Israel through the desert. It was placed in the tabernacle, which was covered by the very presence of God. I mean, remember, they, they lived with those tents, and I always smile when I see artist pictures of, of that. You know, there they are with everybody living in army surplus tents, printed in neat little. I mean, what were the tents that they had? What kind of tents? I mean, if you go to, if you visit the, uh, that part of the world now, the tents they have are animal skin stretched out. I don't know, anyway. I don't know whether Moses said, make it just like this so they all look the same. I don't think so. Anyway. Let's go get canvas and, and make yeah. them that way. Yeah, go to the store. They had care, and, and so there, they were all around the central, of course, the tabernacle, and above that tabernacle is presumably that fire, and then smoke ascending from that fire. I mean, children must have asked their parents all sorts of questions about that. What is that? It was placed in the tabernacle, with the, 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 these Ten Commandments, this, the stones were placed in the tabernacle, uh, which was covered by the very presence of God and later was preserved in Solomon's temple to remind the children of Israel of God's presence with them. The Jews were expected to go to Jerusalem three times a year, if possible, to celebrate various events of the, in their history. And what about the third temple? Was the Ark and the Covenant and the tab Tables of Stone in, the, in, in Herod's temple? No. 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 Hidden. Never was. Lost. It was buried, it was buried or hidden by uh, Jeremiah and his friends at the time just before Noah, I mean, Jerusalem was overrun that final time. When they took the ark out 
to war? Did the cloud go? That's a good question. I don't know. Ken's old, but not that old. <laughs> he knows lots of things. Oh, <laughs> thank you. So what happens on, on Sabbath on, in our experiences today? How do we celebrate? How do we remember these great events from salvation history? Should we have pantomimes or, or plays sometime to try to represent all these things again, just to remind us? Well, early in our history, the Seventh-day Adventist Church was using almost exclusively the King James Version of the Bible. Children were encouraged, in fact required in Adventist schools, to memorize many verses from the Bible. Some of us with gray hair can still remember many of those verses. Are we taking advantage of that? Will our children be lost because they are not memorizing scripture uh, so often today? I don't know. One way in which scripture can be cemented in our memory is by uh, putting, a, putting it to music. And my wife got an idea that I thought was a wonderful idea. I still think it's a wonderful idea. We managed to purchase, back when my children were small, a collection of scripture, uh, a little hymn book with scripture songs. And every week we'd learn a, we'd learn a new scripture song. And if I, every time I read that, oh yeah, if I read that verse in the Bible, oh yeah, I remember that little tune that goes with it. Yeah. <laughs> Many of us may be able to remember scripture songs. Are there um, things that we should go back to in the history of our church? How are things different in the early years of Adventism? Are we spiritual pygmies standing on the shoulders of spiritual giants? In your church, are the older people helping the younger people remember our past? Are the younger people helping the older people understand the challenges of meeting the younger generation? What are we doing to spread the gospel to the whole world? We've got a challenge. We are supposed to take the three angels' messages. Are we doing that? And we are supposed to take it to the entire world. And we, I've just heard from some people who are living in one major country in the world where everybody is being told you have to worship in a certain way. That's in our day. You have to worship in a certain way. You can't, you can't it's against the law to change your religion. We are getting close to the end, folks, and I hope that's clearer to you. Shall we pray? Our kind and loving Father, as we study these lessons, as we think of the issues that we're supposed to remember and not to forget, help us to put the picture fully in our mind, to picture it in the best way we can, the mountain and the tabernacle and creation and the flood. May those things be very real to us, and may we remember as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.